Well, hi there. Just over three years ago, we at Clint's Reptiles released our very first video titled Top 5 Reptiles for Beginners. It is, to this day, still our most viewed video of all time. It's still, you know, every week, except for maybe our, our newest videos, it's the video that gets the most views. It's been a very, very popular video. And none of this would have happened if it weren't for this, this first video of ours. To make that list, an animal had to meet five criteria. First, it had to be readily available. Second, it had to be affordable. Third, it had to be easy to house. Fourth, it had to be easy to feed, or at least that feeders would be easily accessible and not too expensive. And last, it had to be fun to play with and fun to watch. Three years down the road, looking back on that list, it's still an awesome list. I totally recommend every single one of those animals to the right person, including this one. This is a bearded dragon. She's amazing. You were on that list, weren't you, Letty? But a lot of those animals, like the bearded dragon, in fact, all those animals, require some space. What if you don't have that kind of space? This is a 10-gallon aquarium. This is a 10 gallon aquarium I found in my garage. If you're like me, you may have a 10 gallon aquarium lying around in your garage because this is probably the most common aquarium size in the world. Uh, this is actually very roughly the same size as a really popular, it's also very cool enclosure that we've been seeing a lot lately, which are these front entry tanks that measure 12 inches by 12 inches by 18 inches. Those are about 11 gallons. So it's pretty much like if you took this tank and stood it up like this. In fact, a lot of people do take 10 gallon aquariums because they're everywhere and they're cheap and they make front entry enclosures out of them. But this size is really, really common. It's also not very good. There are a lot of problems with a tank this size. One of the biggest problems I have with a 10 gallon aquarium is it's really difficult to get a good temperature gradient. That is, you know, you can, you can have a basking lamp, for example, way off to one side and it's still really close to the cool side of the enclosure. Uh, you'll have better luck with a heat mat because it's not gonna radiate heat all the way down quite as much, but it's hard to get a, a really good hot spot and a really good cool area in a tank this small. Not to mention the fact it's just too little for a lot of animals. In order to make this list of the top five small pets for beginners, it has to meet not only those criteria from our original top five, but it also has to be able to be housed comfortably in a 10 gallon enclosure or one of those 11 gallon vertical tanks. First on our list of five of the best small pets for beginners is the morning gecko. I love these girls. And I say girls because they are all female. They are a parthenogenic species, which means that without mating, at least with a male, they produce eggs that are viable and, and so whoop, the entire population of morning geckos are female. Pros to these geckos, <laughs> other than being incredible athletes, is that they're very, very personable. M most of them are probably not quite as personable as mine. I've, I've raised these up with very close contact from the time that they were tiny little hatchlings. Generally, I would say they're not quite as personable as these, but they're not a shy gecko. They're very, very pleasant and wonderful, and you're gonna see them a lot. It's also very easy to make more of them. As I mentioned, they lay eggs without a mate. It, it does require a fake mating, a, like a pseudo copulation is what it's called, where another female pretends to mate with another for her to begin to make eggs. But if you have at least two morning geckos, it's almost a guarantee you're gonna end up with a whole bunch of morning geckos. Which is fun as long as you know what to do with them. They're really easy to feed. And that's one of the best things about them. They feed mostly on crested gecko diet, which is one of the best things anything could eat. It's a powder that you add some water to so you can have a big bag of it and it lasts a long time and you don't have to run out to the store. They will eat insects, 
but uh, in fact they loved them some insects but you can go a long time without buying them any insects and that is neat they generally don't need any heat unless you keep your house very very cold um, they're probably going to do just fine at the temperatures that you keep your house and that's really awesome because one of the problems with the little 10 gallon aquarium is that it's hard to get a good temperature gradient well not as big of a problem with these girls. And because they're a tropical species and they're small and delicate and they're not really going to do any damage to anything you have in there, you can build just an exquisitely beautiful enclosure for them. Really have all kinds of plants in there and things for them to climb on and just make a wonderful little rainforest scene. And these girls will just thrive in there. But they're not perfect, though, I mean, it's hard to say that to their face. They do have some cons. They are not very good for handling. Um, I would say that my morning geckos are exceptionally good for handling, and it still takes some serious care. These, these girls are little, and they're fast. It's only because my, my particular morning geckos are not afraid of me at all that I feel confident at all to have them out and handle them like this. And you can see, for as calm as she is, I mean, she still does quite a bit of jumping around and so if you are not a confident, experienced gecko handler, I would say your best bet is just not to handle them at all. You also need to watch for small holes, uh, like gaps, so make sure your enclosure has a good lid, and just make sure there's not anything they can fit through, because if they get out, you might be hard-pressed to ever see them again. Oh, look at that eyeball lick. I love that. Geckos are so great. This is one of my very favorites. They also need fairly frequent mistings and care. It's not, it, like I said, it's really simple care. It's just that they, they need it on a regular basis, which is kind of a pain if you're gonna go out of town or something like that. You might need somebody to watch after them. Of course, you can probably transport their entire enclosure. Oh, good jump to your friend's house who's gonna watch after them. You coming up? Good girl. Good jump. Aren't they pleasant? But like I said, uh, most of them are nowhere near this handleable, and this is still pretty difficult. Hard to imagine how anything on this list could be better than this. And yet there's some real contenders. And we have a full video on morning geckos, and we'll have links to that down in the description, if not up in the corner right now. So, if you think this might be the perfect pet reptile for you, you're probably right. You should check that out. Next on our list of the top five small pets for beginners, is a male western hognose snake. And I specify male because there is a considerable size difference between male and female hognose snakes. And females are probably a little bit too big to be on this list. But males, they're just right. This guy here, this is Shovel Face, and he's my male western hognose snake. And he's actually a pretty darn good sized male western hog. Uh, one of the ways that you can tell a male from a female western hog is just by looking at the tail. Males have a considerably longer and skinnier tail than do females, so if you find somebody who's fairly experienced with hogs, they'll be able to tell you right out of the egg if it's a male or a female, which is great because if you need it to be small, then you can request a male. There are a lot of pros to hog nose snakes. One of them would be feeding. They feed fairly infrequently. If, if you feed it once a week, that would be just terrific. And uh, you know, if you're going on vacation or something like that, it could even be less. They're very, very handleable. One of the things I love about snakes is, is handling them. And a hognose snake is a great snake to handle because even though it's not a very big snake, they're also not a really squirrely, wormy, quick sort of a snake. They tend to kind of be methodical about their movements in sort of a similar way to a lot of really big snakes. They just happen to be fairly small. And they're just cute as a button. One of the best faces on any snake anywhere. It's kind of ridiculous, but it actually takes the edge off for a lot of people. They can be afraid of snakes, but they see that goofy nose and they go, okay, tell me about that one. Another big pro is that the heat source you'll need is gonna be a heat mat. And that's something that you can get a decent temperature gradient even in a 10 gallon aquarium. There are some cons though. One of them being they eat rodents and a lot of people are not okay with that. They usually do great 
on frozen thawed rodents. So that means you're not gonna have to give them live rodents. I've never given a live rodent to a hognose snake. Most of mine are like baby birds. They just kind of come, when it's feeding time and they can smell food, they just kind of come up and go, ah, and you just sort of stick food in their mouth and life is great. But uh, they do eat rodents and if you're not okay with that, a hognose snake isn't for you. They are mildly venomous and I, I say that, uh, They've got rear fangs, so if you let them chew on you, they could get some of their saliva into your body. Now, that saliva might be mildly irritating. It's not going to cause you any serious problems. Maybe a little bit of swelling. They're only sort of arguably venomous at all. It's definitely nothing to worry about, but it is there. They also tend to go through kind of a grumpy phase. They usually don't bite during this grumpy phase, but they do a lot of hissing and bluffing and they'll strike and poke you with their goofy little nose. And that can be scary for a first time snake keeper. As we mentioned, the heat source they need is a good one, but they do need a heat source. And, and it's gonna be best if you have that heat source on a thermostat. And so it's kind of expensive, a little bit annoying. You're definitely gonna wanna have a good lid for these guys because they can escape. Snakes are pretty good at escaping. This is not a super duper escape artist of a snake, but if there's a hole big enough for it to fit through, it'll be gone. And last of all, it's a snake. I love snakes. I love that it's a snake. Snakes are wonderful creatures, but for a lot of people, that's just a deal breaker. And so this is a snake. Next on our list of the top five small pets for beginners is the Chilean rosehair tarantula. This is probably, well, definitely of all the things on the list, the animal that I've had the most in my life. I've actually had a tarantula, Chilean rosehair tarantula, more of my life than I've not had one. There are a lot of pros to the Chilean rosehair tarantula. One of the biggest is that care is slightly easier than for a cactus. And I mean that. Uh, it is hard to imagine how an animal could be any easier to care for than a tarantula, other than the fact that they eat insects every now and then. They are super tolerant of handling for a spider. Um, I, I should mention, you know, I'm not handling her too much. They are very fragile and we'll get to that in the cons. And so I don't, I don't do it unless I need to, but they don't seem to have a problem with it generally. Unless you keep your house very cold, they probably don't need a special heat source, which is very nice. And, and you know, one of the other big pros is just the fact that this is a scary animal that's not actually very scary at all. They do have some cons. As I mentioned before, they eat some insects. Not a whole lot. You know, you, you're gonna be buying a couple crickets every now and then but it does mean you need a source of feeder insects and you've got to be okay feeding insects to something. Next is, this is a spider, which is a total deal breaker for a lot of people. It wasn't really until I started doing presentations and showing animals to people that I realized that people are really afraid of spiders. People are kind of afraid of snakes. People are really afraid of spiders. As I mentioned before, they are fairly fragile. Tarantulas don't take falls very well. And this is the reason that I usually choose not to handle mine, not to mention the fact that I don't really take any joy from it. I mean, you can you can get very close to a tarantula. Tarantulas, they're not super active. They're not doing a whole lot. You, you know, you can have a lot of good interaction with the tarantula without picking it up. Though, as I said before, they're good about that if you want to. Uh, a couple of things though to keep in mind, they can kick hairs. So they got all these hairs all over their body and on their abdomen, when they get really concerned, they'll very quickly kick their legs and kick up this like cloud of hairs which can be very, very irritating if you get them on your skin, much worse if you breathe them in or get them in your eyes. This isn't something that happens a lot, but it is something that happens and something to be aware of that might be a reason not to get a tarantula. Also, I've never been bitten by one of my tarantulas, but uh, even though their venom isn't very powerful, it doesn't look like fun. Those fangs are pretty big. And so they're not inclined to bite you when you're handling them. They might not realize that they're not on the ground. It's just the ground got warm and weird all of a sudden, but things don't tend to bite the ground. That said, if it did happen, it'd be very disappointing. Another potential con is the first time they molt. If you don't know that they're molting, which means shedding their, their exoskeleton, uh, you might think your spider died. Just no, it hasn't. Just leave it alone. In the morning, it'll be fine. Next on our list of the top five small pets for beginners, is the American green tree frog. I love green tree frogs. I've, 
Uh, I've had them in my life for quite a bit of it. I, I really enjoyed them. I kept them when I was in college, and then when I, I went and I lived in Florida for a while, and they were everywhere, and I so enjoyed that. There are a lot of pros to these glorious little frogs. One of them is that they are really fun to feed. I've kept other tree frogs where you don't even see them eat. You know, they just, they just look like a blob on the side of the tank during the day and crickets disappear at night. That is not the case with green tree frogs. When you throw crickets in there, pff, they're on it. And they are jumping from all the way across the enclosure to get to them. It's a really exciting event. Most of them that are in captivity, one of the unfortunate things about these is a lot of them are wild caught. Uh, their populations seem to be doing okay. But because they're wild caught, usually during the spawn, most of them in captivity are males. And so generally your green tree frog will sing to you at night, which is kind of pleasant. They're also really pretty. I mean, you know, they, they've got a, a green that will vary in intensity depending on their mood from very, very dark to very, very light green. And they've got this little stripe that goes down their lip and along their side. They're kind of like if you were to imagine the stereotypical frog, this is it. But they nail it. As I mentioned before, for a tree frog, these guys are very active. You will actually see them do things, which doesn't sound like much, but I've kept a lot of other tree frogs where you didn't see them do anything unless you were watching them in the middle of the night with tiny amounts of light. They also probably don't need any special heat unless your house is very, very cold. So that's a huge benefit. And you can keep them in a really beautiful enclosure like the morning geckos. Uh, these guys will do really well in a planted bioactive sort of enclosure, which can be really fun. Like a lot of the things on this list, they eat insects. And that means that you need somewhere to get insects on a regular basis. That's kind of a bummer. They also will sing to you. We said that was a pro. Not as much though if you're sleeping. It's also best because these are an amphibian to only handle them with gloves or if you're gonna handle them without gloves to make sure your hands are extremely clean, not just from dirt and viruses and things like that, but also from soap. All of that stuff is gone, no chemicals. Speaking of chemicals, you need to be very, very careful with their water quality. And you're gonna need to mist them fairly regularly, less often if you have a water feature, like you see in this enclosure behind us. But you're gonna need to mist them and have a, a supply of clean water all the time. And that can really tie you down. You can't leave them for more than a couple days without some sort of maintenance for them. But overall, they're stinking rad. Another pro, they're dirt cheap. You can get one for five to ten dollars. Man, best five to ten dollars you'll ever spend. As long as you spend the other money they'll need. I'd like to take a moment just to say thank you to our patrons at Patreon that help support this channel. Especially during this weird time when Clint's Reptile Room is closed, you know, and and we're looking for a way to try to keep it open. Uh, having having support from Patreon has really, really helped keep this channel alive and going. And one of our ways of saying thank you to all of you is, is we've been trying to do live streams regularly to just help us all get through this weird time. We want to uh, mention that we often open things up to our patrons at Patreon to ask us a bunch of questions in advance, and, and uh, we usually cover those at the beginning of the live streams. So, might be a reason to join. Next on our list, the five of the best small pets for beginners is the male Kenyan sand boa. Just like hognose snakes, there's some serious sexual dimorphism or serious size difference between male and female Kenyan sand boas. And to meet the criteria for this list, only the male fits it. Much like the hognose snake though, you can sex them uh, right from when they're first born. These don't actually hatch out of an egg, they're born. But males again have a longer and skinnier tail than do females. And so somebody who knows Kenyan sand boas pretty well should be able to identify a male for you very quickly and get you a male Kenyan sand boa. When it comes to pros, there are a lot of pros to these goofy little fellas. I just love them so much. First off, like hognose snakes, they feed fairly infrequently. Uh, if you're feeding them once a week, maybe every two weeks, that's gonna be just great. And if you go on vacation, unless it's gonna be like a month, uh, they're probably not going to need to be fed while you're gone. That's awesome. 
they're also very handleable. Again, like hognose snakes, these guys actually behave a lot like big snakes. They're very slow and methodical when you handle them. They're not quick and darty, zipping around. It's awesome. They're just so great to handle. They have amazing colors. This is the wild type coloration. It's like a black and orange. And then there are all sorts of crazy morphs out there as well. None of them are very expensive. Well, I shouldn't say none, but most of them are pretty affordable. And the wild type, it's hard to beat that. And they got a goofy face. It's so goofy. It's really only rivaled in goofiness by the hognose snake. A lot of people are gonna fall for that face even if they're normally very scared of snakes. You gotta love them. But there are some cons. Like the hognose snake, they eat rodents. So if you're opposed to that, snakes generally probably not for you. They can be bitey and they bite kind of funny. They kind of whip their head around with their mouth open. I've never been bitten by a sand boa. It seems to vary a lot based on the individual, but that is something to watch out for. They also hide most of the day. You'll notice their eyes are up on top of their head. That's because they hide under the sand in the wild. And that's what they're gonna wanna do most of the time. They're gonna be buried under their substrate with just their little eyeballs poking up. And so you won't see them very much. Also like the hog, they're gonna need a heat source. But again, it's a heat pad, you know, best to use it with a thermostat, but that's the best kind of heat source there is for a 10 gallon aquarium. And that's why they're on this list. In conclusion, reptiles, arthropods, and amphibians, a lot of them make really awesome pets. And even when space is a factor, there are still a lot of really great options out there. In addition to the five that we've mentioned here, which are probably some of the most affordable and easy to find, there are also a lot of other really good options that we've covered in previous videos. And we wanna mention them right now as essentially honorable mentions. These include children's pythons, smaller day gecko species, like the gold dust day gecko, peacock day geckos, neon day geckos, chameleon geckos, which are just unbelievable and handleable, pictus geckos, black widow spiders, jumping spiders, praying mantises, spotted salamanders, and Argentine tegus. Okay, just kidding. That was on our list of giant pet reptiles. And it might be the coolest one there is. As always, like and subscribe. And we hope to see you real soon. Say goodbye, Gus. Ah, roll over. Good boy. Just over three years ago. What, 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 what are you doing? Well, hi there. Yeah. Where's the well hi there? <laughs> that video didn't start with the well hi there either. <laughs> you gotta do the well hi there. What? Let me use the knife. Are you doing? Okay. Oh, Just use your hand, you weirdo. Oh, uh, am I the weirdo? Oh, we're so no. Because my dumb hands don't turn over, I'm not very good at holding tarantulas and they're so fragile. Oh my gosh, there's something disturbing about the way she just moved. Something it. in the way she <laughs> moves. <laughs> If you're ever looking for uh, some pretty bad camera skills, you should watch me in our first video ever, as I'm constantly looking at Michelle when I talk about the animals, because she has such good response. I, uh, I often would forget that we were filming. I'd be like, uh-huh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so cool. <laughs> now I want one.